Hello. Hello, and welcome to the top five STEM activities for gifted youth. Uh, I'm Charlton Wolfgang. I am a professor, associate professor of gifted and STEM education at Millersville University in Millersville, Pennsylvania in the US. And I have a background as a gifted support teacher, a science teacher um, as well. And so what I do at the higher ed level now is I combine both of those two fields, two of my passion areas together uh, and um, teach undergraduate students as well as graduate students in these fields. And I'm a member of the Central PA uh, Mensa group. So uh, I selected the, the top five STEM activities. And this was challenging because there are so many wonderful um, you know, activities, programs, and pursuits that uh, gifted youth can do. But I, I chose these five because they represent a variety of STEM-based activities and projects that gifted youth can do at home, at school, or in your communities, or in a combination of those places. And I selected these, and here they are, because most of them can be done for free or with limited upfront costs, with the exception of the Makey Makey, which I will explain more about when I get to that slide. All of them can be done by gifted youth of all ages with some modifications. Now, most of these require internet access and can be done on a cell phone, a tablet, or a computer, so they're pretty much platform agnostic. And all of these activities focus on the four C's of 21st century learning sometimes collectively called the learning skills, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Now they also encourage life skills, including flexibility, leadership, initiative, productivity, and social skills. So the first one that I'd like to highlight is um, citizen science. And um, this is um, an activity, actually a group of activities that uh, you probably have heard of. Sometimes it's called community science, amateur science, crowdsourced science, or volunteer monitoring. But essentially, it's scientific research conducted with participation from the public. And this is one of my favorite activities that I um, used to have my, my gifted middle school students participate in, and they absolutely loved it. So through citizen science, gifted youth can participate voluntarily in the scientific process, uh, addressing authentic real-world problems, in ways that may include formulating research questions, conducting scientific experiments, collecting and analyzing data, interpreting results, making new discoveries, developing technologies and applications, as well as solving complex problems. And there's tremendous variation in the types of projects, including like doing bird counts in your backyard, you can scan images online to count the number of animals in a picture, uh, water sampling, air sampling, classifying galaxies, uh, observing behavior of animals or other people, and even one of my favorites I just recently saw, examining the types of bacteria inhabiting your belly button. Now, most projects do not require any specialized equipment or knowledge, uh, which really makes them accessible to the general public. So the sites listed here on the screen are some of the most well-known and widely used citizen science sites. And they offer searchable menus of projects in all types of science and engineering fields. And they even allow users to propose projects of their own. And uh, they're always changing. So I recommend going back and, and visiting these uh, you know, periodically and seeing which ones really speak to you. Some of them are regionally specific, but some of them are uh, you know, global, international. Some of them are national ones, but they, they are, a lot of them are found from around the world. So these are great opportunities to participate in science, networking with other volunteers, networking with the scientists, and you know, actually doing some real science, being able to um, you know, act on those areas of passion. So another one which many people in the STEM fields are familiar with, but perhaps you've not heard of this one, uh, is something called the Makey Makey. Now, this is the only commercial product that I'm going to be talking about today, and it's because I think this is such a powerful invention tool. I've seen students use these to do all kinds of really amazing things, uh, you know, from uh, technology to help uh, um, people with um, physical disabilities, to games, to you know, burglar alarms to keep your, you know, your brother or your sister out of your bedroom, all those kinds of things and many, many more. 
Now the Makey Makey is really just a simple little microcontroller that you plug into your computer via USB port and it uh, takes over the touchpad and the keyboard and the mouse. So what it does is it allows you to use this as an alternative input. So you can turn everyday objects into uh, touchpads and touchpads and keyboards and combine them with the internet. So it's a really simple invention kit for beginners as well as experts doing art, engineering, and everything in between. So really STEAM. And with this microcontroller, you can make any conductive material act as the input device for a computer. So this includes things like fruits and vegetables and graphite drawings on paper because graphite is conductive, um, water, modeling clay, aluminum foil, and many other objects and materials. And because it, becomes, it comes pre-programmed, you don't even need to have any coding experience to use it. And, but once you start learning coding, then you can actually start to develop and create your own uh, programs to use with the Makey Makey. And uh, I'll be talking about some coding uh, apps in the next slide. And uh, Scratch works really well with the Makey Makey. And there, if you just search on YouTube, you search online or go to Makey Makey site, you'll see there are hundreds, if not thousands of um, projects that people have uploaded. So it's very much a crowdsourced sort of activity. And people are very um, interested in sharing their, their projects with everyone as a part of the broader maker community, which is really good at collaborating and sharing. So the next one, as I had mentioned, is uh, coding. This is fundamental really to the STEM fields. And if you're going to learn any language, this isn't a really important language to learn um, today because there's a couple of reasons. Um, first off, um, we should all have a basic understanding of coding. So why? Well, it helps us to gain a better understanding of and interact with the different types of technology that we use every day, including the computer that I'm on right now, your smartphone, your tablet, social media networks, all of those run on the backbone of coding. And it's important that, that everyone um, really has at least a basic understanding of how to code. There's a lot of other um, advantages though from learning to code, much like learning other languages, speaking multiple languages, which improves, you know, your, um, it improves your, your mindset, it incre increases creativity, empowers you to express yourself, and coding is also like another language in that it does that. And it improves creativity, as I had mentioned. Uh, it improves your problem solving skills, persistence, collaboration, and communication, those 21st century skills I had mentioned earlier on. But it also fosters the development of executive functioning skills, uh, such as planning and mathematical thinking, which can help gifted youth excel academically. And um, there's varying levels of coding. Uh, I'm showing here code, if you've heard of code.org, um, which, and in fact, all four of these have free um, apps for students to use, but code.org is actually a whole tutorial and learning system that teachers can use, but students can also self-pace themselves through it. And it, what it does is it gradually builds your coding um, expertise through scaffolded lessons, videos, um, there's analog coding as well with code.org, so you don't even need a computer to do that. You can simply have a piece of paper, a graph paper, or make your own graph on paper and, and begin to learn some simple coding. Scratch Junior uh, is targeting uh, younger learners, gives you an introduction to coding, and then when you're ready to graduate from Scratch Junior to Scratch, you can. Uh, it's a drag and drop sort of programming language. Blockly also gradually walks you through. And what really is um, just fundamentally, I think, important about all of these apps is that they support you through the process of learning coding. And um, through these um, applications, then you're able to learn more and more about coding. And as I had mentioned in the previous slide, these are great um, tools to be able to use to interact with um, the Makey Makey, as well as other types of hardware. So another type of activity that uh, works really well with students of all age levels are engineering design challenges. And these are something that I've been using with students for many, many years. I use them with my undergraduate students, my graduate students, my middle school students, elementary school students. I actually have my undergraduate students write un engineering design challenges for students in grades three through five. And there are many benefits to doing engineering design challenges. Um, and it's because engineering design is a, it's a component, a key component of STEM education. 
So the engineering design process emphasizes open-ended problem solving and encourages you to learn from failure, which is an important skill for, for all of us, but I think in particular too, for gifted youth to develop. Because it reminds us that real learning takes place in the struggle, at the point where things aren't proceeding or working out as expected. And then the onus is on us as the learner to figure out how to move forward. And perhaps you've heard of the, uh, the acronym FAIL, first attempt in learning. And engineering design challenges really focus on that, um, that approach that we're going to encounter failure many, many times as we, we work on uh, these challenges. But the process of engineering and design is an iterative one. It means that we're gonna be repeating all or some of the steps as many times as needed, making improvements along the way as we learn from failure and uncover new design possibilities to arrive at solutions. So these are just what I have on the screen here are just some examples of um, organizations, websites that provide free engineering design challenges. And they run the gamut from sustainable design to you know, environmental fo environmentally focused types of challenges to you know, outer space and landing on Mars and designing a rover that can safely land there to building the traditional bridge building and tower building types of activities. And what really makes these really powerful, again, as I had mentioned, is they're free, they're accessible to everyone, but a lot of these also involve very simple materials, which you may have around the house. And uh, what unites all engineering design challenges uh, together is um, they really get you working through the engineering design process. And so that's what I wanna show you here. Now, this particular one is courtesy of our friends at teachengineering.org, which is an excellent source of all kinds of information about engineering. And as you can see from the design process, it starts with asking the question and then once you've identified what the question is, then you research it, you get the background knowledge to build upon, and then you come up with ideas for what are some possible solutions to that problem. Then you develop a plan for that, and you evaluate the different plans and see which ones you want to try first. Then you develop, you create your pre prototype. And once you've built your prototype, then you test it out. And this is where that iterative design comes in, because once you've tested your prototype, you'll identify most likely you know, issues with it that you want to improve upon, or perhaps your prototype design in itself is doesn't work. And so you go back to uh, the imagination, planning and creation stage again and again. And that's leads us to improve where we make small tweaks, sometimes revisit it for, and go back to the beginning. But ultimately, again, it's a, this is a process, which is why it's a circular type of process. It's not linear. And this really encourages students then to be able to um, really um, just kind of delve into that design process and be creative as well as thinking critically. So the last um, top STEM activity that I wanted to talk about today is reverse engineering. And this is related to the engineering design process, but it kind of takes it and flips it on its head. Uh, and reverse engineering is a lot like it sounds. We, instead of uh, develop, attacking a problem, planning it out, building uh, our prototype and testing it, we start with the existing object and then we disassemble it. We basically reverse the engineering that went into it, pull it apart, uh, and then look at all the different component pieces and see how they all work together to make that object. So by studying an existing engineered object, we can learn a lot about how the object was designed and how it works. So, you know, what steps might an engineer take to figure out and understand how an existing product works? Well, we take it apart. And um, that's what we call reverse engineering. And it uh, helps us to understand how it functions and also helps us to determine ways that we can possibly improve it. So by carefully discovering how something was made and how it works, we can make suggestions for areas of improvement of the product. And this is something that engineers do in the field all the time. Sometimes the improvement is very simple. Like for example, let's say that you have a computer hard drive and you reverse engineer it and you notice that there is a screw in that hard drive that isn't necessary. Now this might seem like a really small detail, but let's say that that screw costs five cents and you remove it from your future design. And so for a million computer hard drives manufactured in a year, you would save $50,000. So imagine if you found two screws that weren't necessary. So a few small changes can make a really big difference uh, in reverse engineering. However, it's important to note that reverse engineering isn't simply taking something apart. 
It requires careful observation, disassembly, documentation. Oftentimes, we'll take the pieces apart, lay them out on paper, trace them, label them, notate them, so that you're um, documenting all of the different pieces and how they go together. Then you're analyzing them and finally reporting them out. And uh, many times, the reverse engineering is what we would call a non-destructive process. So that means that the object or component that you take apart, you could reassemble it and it would still function just as it did before you took it apart. And that is our goal with reverse engineering. So like the other four activities that I mentioned earlier, reverse engineering can be enjoyed by gifted youth of all ages. Younger learners can tackle simpler objects like a flashlight or maybe a wind-up car with a little, uh, you know, with, with a little gear mechanism and a spring while older students could examine a desktop computer or perhaps a printer. I've seen students take apart a small engine, an internal combustion engine, clean it up, reassemble it, and get it running again. And so through that activity, they've learned how an internal combustion engine works. So regardless of the type of object, the focus should be on considering ways to improve the device's function, uh, make it more efficient, cost efficient as well as energy efficient, make it more environmentally friendly, uh, or change its function, or just create another use for it. Looking at the pieces and thinking about the object as a whole, how could you reuse this in another way? So it's a great way to uh, incorporate, some, incorporate some creative thinking into uh, the engineering design process. So this was just a quick kind of exploration of of five different activities that I think are really uh, valuable, beneficial, and frankly, a lot of fun for gifted learners to do. And so these are my top five that I recommend. Uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this. This is my contact info, charlton.wolfgang at millersville.edu. And I'm also going to share out some links uh, at the end of this video here that'll be below the video so that uh, it can, you can take you to some of these sites that I mentioned here uh, in the five uh, types of activities that um, I, I mentioned throughout the video. So thank you very much. And um, I hope that uh, you found this to be valuable and of interest.